My name is uh, Chris Capaldo. I'm an assistant professor in biology at Hawaii Pacific University. And I'd like to talk about um, COVID-19 and the biology of the virus. Um, I think that uh, we're gonna hold our questions to the end. Uh, it's gonna be a short, shortish presentation because I'd like an opportunity for as many people as possible to ask questions. So with that in mind, um, I gotta say that this is not a situation that we fully understand what is going on. And I need to start my presentation with a disclaimer. And that's that um, I'm not a virologist or a medical practitioner. Uh, I'm a PhD in pharmacology, which means drug discovery and drug design. And I specialize in research, trying to find cures for immunological and inflammatory diseases. Uh, so I'm not a specialist in, in most of, if not many of the things that we're gonna be talking about today. And I'm just trying to communicate what my understanding is. And I think there's some very useful information in here as well. And uh, a lot of, I think, hope for, for treatments in progress. So if we're all here, let me, let me start with what I think is gonna be the most usable information uh, for everybody uh, here today. So what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is caused by a virus called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, COVID-2. It's a coronavirus, and it causes a lower respiratory tract infection. It manifests as pneumonia. It has a disturbingly high fatality rate of people hospitalized between 0.5 and 10%. And we need to put a big asterisk by that fatality rate and really dig into that deeper. But people with COVID-19 symptoms include a fever and a cough. And if you're experiencing these symptoms, contact a healthcare professional as soon as you can. Uh, they're doing a lot of telemedicine these days and it's good to get on people's radar and just check in with your healthcare provider. A lot of the information we'll talk about today is specific to Hawaii. I'm sure your state may have something similar in mind if you're uh, joining us from outside of Hawaii, but the University of Hawaii has a symptom tracker and they're trying to keep track of the disease spread not by testing, but just people recording their symptoms. So if you're having any of these symptoms, please log into the symptom tracker and just um, record yourself so you can be uh, a data point and maybe they can get a better feeling for where this disease is spreading. So what should we be doing right now? Now is really the time in, in this pandemic when we maximize our social distancing behavior. So now and for the next week or so, um, if you have to leave the house, try to wear a mask. So why should you be doing this at this point? Most people with COVID-19 don't show any symptoms at all, uh, but they're still capable of spreading the disease to other people. And the goal is to really keep this disease out of vulnerable populations, uh, people with pre-existing conditions, elderly populations. And let, let's, let's spend some time with that idea. The University of Washington has made a mathematical algorithm to try to predict the spread of the disease in each state. If you go to the link provided on this slide, and I think this presentation will be made available to all of you, you can use the drop-down tab in green at the top of this slide, and you can find the state you're in. Right now, we're looking at Hawaii. This is a mathematical formula that's trying to predict how the disease is gonna spread in your community. And it's trying to evaluate how prepared your hospital is to deal with the number of expected cases. You'll notice that this data appears with the date on the x-axis going from left to right. 
And it starts, this data starts about April 1 for Hawaii. That's going to be different depending on what state you're in. And there's a mountain that designates the amount of medical resources that are needed over the next month from April 1 to May 1 in Hawaii. This is a count of the number of hospital beds that are needed to accommodate the potential number of sick people that Hawaii will have. Also, it's gonna keep track of the number of expected intensive care unit beds and invasive ventilators that Hawaii has and potentially needs. Now, with most mathematical predictions, there's a lot of error and potential for change over time. And that's indicated by that pink area. The average expected result is the dotted lines that you see. This data is then broken down further into colors. We have a green, a blue, and a pink. The pink area indicates the number of expected hospital beds for infected patients. And you can see there's about 1,600 possible, at maximum, uh, possible beds that are gonna be required to uh, treat patients uh, that come in. The blue line and green line represent ICU beds needed and invasive ventilators. If you look closely, you'll notice that there's some vertical or horizontal lines going across this data. Let's look at the one at about 1,000. That purple line indicates the current capacity for hospitals in Hawaii as of today, about 1,000 beds. That's all the beds Hawaii has to treat all the population of Hawaii for all diseases that we have not just COVID-19 patients. So you can see there is a possibility still that Hawaii will vastly exceed the number of beds that it needs to treat COVID patients. Second, if we look down at the green line that's near the bottom, that indicates the number of ICU beds that are gonna be needed for very critically ill patients. And it looks like we're projected possibly to exceed uh, our capacity to treat those patients. COVID-19 has between a one and a two week incubation period. Meaning that if you come into contact with someone that uh, has the disease and you uh, get infected with the virus, you may not show symptoms for up to two weeks. This data is based on the number of people that are gonna come into the hospital requiring care. Therefore, the peak that you see there is the peak need for medical resources. I've gone ahead and extrapolated out a rough two week period prior to that peak to represent the general risk that you yourself would either be infected or infect someone else if you had the virus. And that's the period that we're in today. We here in Hawaii haven't maximized our hospital capacities yet, and we expect to see that peak somewhere near the middle of the month. But we are directly underneath the peak possibility of getting infected or passing on that infection. So, what I'm encouraging you to do with this data is to just recognize that this right now in the next two weeks is the period where your social distancing will have the maximum benefit for people that are susceptible to this disease. So I'm really encouraging people, go ahead and stay at home, skip a week of jogging. And if you have to leave the home, uh, wear a mask. And this is really gonna protect yourself and your community. We have some information from the uh, Hawaii Department of Health that indicates where the infected uh, populations are on island 
And it's looking like the um, Honolulu, Hawaii, Kai uh, to Kailua, Kaneohe areas are the hotspots for spread and infection. When people get tested for COVID-19, they fill out an application and they write down their zip code. This is just an amalgamation of what those zip codes indicate. And I think it's a good indicator of where the disease is currently spreading as of April 6th. You'll notice that some of us do live in these hotspots and it includes the HPU campus. So let's help to flatten this curve. And this is vitally important. So there's some really tragic news stories from New York City and elsewhere and overseas that the fatality rates for COVID-19 increase dramatically when hospitals start to get flooded with patients. If we start to exceed the capacity of our hospitals, this is a real danger point for this disease. So if we don't have enough hospital beds, ICU beds, and ventilators, that's the real danger. So if we can maximize social distancing now and wear masks out in public, we can, we can do, have that maximal ven uh, benefit this next few weeks uh, on keeping those rates down as low as possible. Okay. By the way, if you're in Hawaii or elsewhere, uh, take a look at this site regularly. Um, it'll give you some indication of when an expected end to your uh, high-risk season is going to be for this disease. We'll have to see how the data plays out. This site is updated every couple days based on new data that comes in, so real data. And these, all these charts are subject to change. And as I've been keeping track of these, um, Nationwide, the trend is towards more optimistic outcomes. So there is some hope out there based on the data that's coming in. Uh, infection rates are slowing. Social distancing that we have engaged with is slowing the spread of this virus as we speak. So th there is some hope out there. So if you have access to a mask or if you'd like to make a mask, or if you have um, gloves or other personal protective equipment or PPE, um, it's important that you know how to use it uh, to best benefit. In a research setting, we always assume that our hands are contaminated, for example. So when we use our gloves, we assume they're contaminated, whether or not that's a potential or not, and we have a very specific methodology for taking off our gloves. The CDC has a very concise video that shows you how to take off gloves, also how to take off masks appropriately. If you're wearing a face mask, you don't wanna to be touching your face. Second, and maybe we can discuss this a little further, um, the nature of this virus, it's really susceptible even to soaps. Soaps, alcohols, bleaches. So hand washing is really, really, really effective. So before you go, to, uh, when you, maybe you come in after a shopping trip, be sure to wash your hands. There's some videos on CDC or Center for Disease Control recommendations on hand washing and how to disinfect surfaces, high contact surfaces in your home, like the doorknob uh, going in and out of your home or your refrigerator door, things like that. So if you have questions, um, these links are provided. You can, you can go check those out. Okay, so that's, I think, um, the really need to know information. And I'd like to make one more segue before we get into the biology. And that's to just highlight some of the activities that Hawaii Pacific University is engaged in to try to mit mitigate the impact of this disease. Um, first of all, the first thing we immediately engaged in was a donation drive to area hospitals and clinics. And we've donated thousands of gloves, gowns, eyewear, all kinds of personal protective equipment to hospitals and clinics. Uh, students, HPU students, have been, been engaged in phone banks trying to solicit donations from unlikely places like veterinary clinics, dental offices, um, just anywhere they can think of that may have surplus equipment right now. Thirdly, we're trying to coordinate our further efforts that I'll describe briefly with the Hawaii Department of Health, uh, coordinate with area hospitals and other state relief organizations. 
We have some do-it-yourself initiatives that are being stimulated by the Pre-Health Club. And you can contact Caroline Jones uh, about uh, some of these further efforts. For example, we're participating in the 100 million mask drive. This is a make your own mask initiative to try to uh, donate as many masks as possible so that we can really get a lot of masks into the community so that we can bulk up reserves of personal protective equipment at hospitals. Second, we're having an initiative that students can participate in, uh, making your own disinfectant wipes. Uh, these are the sorts of things that are starting to run out in stores. You can make them at home uh, quite easily, and we're going to try to generate a surplus of those with materials we have on hand. Um, it's important, students, that if you'd like to volunteer, that we do it in a way that you maintain your social distancing while we, while we contribute. I'd also like to point out some really, really fascinating initiatives. There's going to be some talks next week, I think, on these. The biomedical engineering department has two really exciting initiatives. One is to engineer a safer face shield for medical staff. And um, uh, Robert Nakata, Bob Nakata is going to be talking about that next week. And so please tune in if you're interested in hearing more about that. Students are also involved in 3D printing and PPE manufacturing on island. And we're doing that with the resources we have here on hand and with student help. Lastly, I want to um, point out that um, Nathan Dawson in the, the physics department is trying to use uh, laser technology to build uh, PPE recycling units. So this virus is going to be, like most viruses, susceptible to UV light. So we're trying to not just make more personal protective equipment for physicians and for the public, but to learn efficient ways that we can recycle existing material and stretch our supplies that much further. Now, remember the goal here is to not exceed our capacity and our supplies. That's a real dangerous point for this disease, okay? And I'd, I'd like to point out one, one student in particular, uh, it's, um, Elizabeth Fisher, and there's many others doing these tasks. They're, they're making some quite stylish uh, masks. This is her uh, uh, bumblebees. And here's David Horgan delivering a truckload of supplies to Castle Medical, Medical Center. So we're getting a lot of contributions um, uh, across HPU faculty, uh, staff, and, and students. Now let's change gear and let's talk about some of the biology of this disease. And again, with a disclaimer that I'm not a specialist in a lot of this, this, these things, but uh, you know, we're, we're all doing our best these days, okay? So, the virus is uh, SARS-CoV-2. And on the left-hand side, you'll see an image. This is actually the viral coat or capsid. It, it is a protective shell and it's coated in those red, what's called spike proteins. Now, if we can cut that in half and look inside, imagine cutting a golf ball in half and looking inside there, you would see an RNA-based genome. It's a little bit different from the genomes that we have in our cells, and that it's made of RNA, but it contains the instructions to make copies of the virus, right? So outside you have a proteinaceous shell, inside you have the business end of the virus, the code or instructions for making more virus. Here's how infection works. Um, to the best of our knowledge, this is an airborne respiratory infection. There was a lot of uh, controversy about surface contamination. I think uh, we're leaning now towards airborne aerosolized particles. Therefore, an infected person that's having pneumonia-like symptoms is coughing and sneezing viral particles from their mouth and nose. And this is why masks are becoming more and more emphasized. It's possible that a healthy individual will breathe one or more of these particles into their lungs. And this is the dominant theory of transmission for particles at this point. Let's just zoom in really quickly into the lung space. The lung is, is a 
is a large organ in your chest and it can fill up with inflated, uh, when it's inflated with air. At the very base of all those ducts that conduct the air into your lungs, there are small vacuoles or small bags. And they're indicated in this image, if we zoom into one little area of the lung, by the termini there, they look like little buds. It's the white part. The white part would be filled with air. And the buds, that's where we're gonna focus in here for some biology. Imagine that one of those viral particles has entered into the lung, it would be traveling down those white areas there. Okay. In those pockets, you have a white area that would be the airspace, and it would be continuous with the outside environment. You have a lining of cells in the lung, and those are designated in green. Now this is living material of the lung, and it's the interface, the first interface between the outside environment and your body. So it needs to be a very strong barrier. On the other sides of those cells, you're gonna have blood vessels, right? Normally, this is a really, really convenient and effective relationship. That blood vessel is very, very close to the cells that line your lung. And those lung cells, they're really, really skinny and flat. This is really good for getting oxygen into your body and then releasing CO2. Unfortunately, this is the region where the virus will bind to cells and cause an infection. On the left-hand side, you're gonna see a cartoon here. There's a little viral particle. There's a cartoon of green cells. The blood vessel is indicated in pink. On the right-hand side, is an electron micrograph from the Canadian Center for Infectious Disease of the actual COVID-19 viral particle interacting with one of those cells. You'll notice if you squint, the ball-shaped material on the right-hand side is coated with those spike proteins. You can see them, they're little hazy bits. This is really, really zoomed in. This is zoomed in probably to the size of a micron. So one one thousandth of, um, of a millimeter. So very, very tiny. Let's look at and imagine one viral particle interacting with lung cells. So on the top of this slide, you'll have the airspace with a viral particle in it. It's gonna drop down onto the cells and those are designated as those pinkish boxes. And there's five different cells in this image. The, the blue ovals would be the nuclei or genetic material for each one of those cells. On the bottom of the slide, that would represent your body or the internal spaces of your body. Okay. This would be really zoomed in yet again, where we have just one viral particle and that virus is attaching itself to the outside layer of one of those epithelial cells or cells that line the lung space. And the virus is attaching to your lung through protein-protein interactions. Spike proteins that you can see as those triangles that ring all the way around the outside surface of that viral coat are interacting with a protein normally expressed on your lung called the ACE2 receptor. That's usually not its function, but the virus is trying to trick the cell into gobbling up that virus. You'll also notice some other features that are highlighted in this image. One is that you have a number of different kinds of proteins encircling the RNA that is the genetic code for that virus. If we can break that uh, protective barrier, we can uh, try to destroy that virus inside. But if it contacts that ACE2 receptor inside your lung, it sets off a chain reaction. It recruits other proteins called co-receptors, here indicated by that green shape. That green shape also resides in the outside surface of your cell, the surface that faces your lungs, and it stabilizes the interaction between the virus and your body. 
Once that stabilization occurs, the cell is tricked and it internalizes the virus inside the cell, the epithelial cells that line the lung space. So now the virus has invaded your body, but just the surface lining of your lungs. I know this is a very complicated slide. There's a lot of information on it, but the information tells us something about how the virus tricks the cell into making copies of more virus. Now remember, we haven't left the lung tissue at all. This is all happening in those green cells that we saw that line the lung space. We've looked at how the ACE2 receptor binds to and attaches to that virus and allows viral entry into the cell. All cells in your body have the ability to make copies of RNA. Um, the RNA virus is a little bit specific and we won't get into the details of that, but I'd like this slide to emphasize that once a virus gets into that cell, it tricks the cell into making many, many, many copies of itself, of the virus. Those viral copies then get extruded back out into the lung space, into the airspace of the lung. Those viruses then get coughed out of your body, and this is how that virus is replicating and spreading. How can we use the knowledge that we're gaining about COVID and our previous knowledge about viral infections and respiratory infections to try to fight this disease today? Normally, a viral infection and the successful recovery from a viral infection, it requires a robust immune response from your body but a very specific one, notably an antiviral immune response. Second, it requires what we call both innate immune responses and adaptive immune responses. Remember that humanity is not immunologically ready for COVID-19 because as a population, as a, as a species, we have not encountered it before. So we don't have an adaptive response. That's the part of the immune response that is designed to face new challenges and remember old challenges. Now, it's important, first of all, that we know that severe cases, really um, dangerous cases, are lasting more than two weeks. People are sick for two weeks or more. And those dangerous cases are associated with what we call a cytokine storm, which is a high volume, non-specific or general, broad response to pathogens. Let's dig into that concept in a little bit more detail. So first of all, let's discuss a, the difference between innate responses and adaptive responses. So innate responses, are cellular responses that happen at the site of infection. Your cells that line those alveolar spaces, those sacs, the green cells we looked at earlier, they have defenses built in already. They're always present. They're always on the lookout for pathogens. And they're already in the lung before the pathogen even arrives. And they're on the hunt for pathogen shapes so a cell that's invaded by a virus knows that it has been invaded and sets off warning bells and alarms to surrounding tissues and material. The second major concept in immunity is that the adaptive immunity response. It's slower, but it is specific for each individual pathogen per infection. The specificity of that response in an adaptive immune response requires cells called T cells or T lymphocytes. They express proteins that will bind uniquely and specifically to COVID-19 or any other pathogen we wanna discuss. That's your adaptive response. And they take different amounts of time. Your innate response happen on the order of hours, whereas your adaptive responses can take many days. 
there's two types of adaptive responses we want to talk about today. One is your T lymphocyte response, and that's to direct pathogen-specific activity of your tissue and immune cells to COVID-19. The second is your B cell response. B cells produce antibodies, and antibodies can be released and fight uh, the virus. So before we return to a little bit more biology, I'd like to discuss some of the epidemiology of this disease. Unfortunately, disease susceptibility, not in the susceptibility for infection, but the development of the disease correlates with age. Notice on this chart that young people, uh, toddlers and infants, have almost no susceptibility to developing disease. What's been found is that young people do get infected and can pass on the infection, but they're not developing dangerous symptoms. The data says that around 18 years of age, patients begin to develop dangerous symptoms and that the likelihood of developing dangerous symptoms is increasing with age. Older individuals are much more likely to have detrimental effects for COVID-19 than young people. All ages are acquiring this disease, but only some age groups are developing dangerous symptoms. It's been known for some time that your immune system changes with age. Young people have a host of what we call naive T cells. T cells are the cells that allow an adaptive response. They allow your body to meet new challenges and meet new pathogens that the body has never seen before. Young people have an abundance of these types of cells, whereas older people have what we call memory T cells, or cells that have been retained because they've seen specific pathogens in the environment. Older people also have diminished naive T cells, thereby reducing their ability to respond to new pathogens. Secondarily, the number of cells produced in older, older individuals is lower. This leads me to believe that we may be dealing with a disease that nobody's seen before, and it's challenging your adaptive responses. Young people can compensate, produce effective antibodies. Older people are struggling to do so. This may be a reason why this is happening, but I think this data really does overlap our understanding of naive T cells and our understanding of the demographics of disease susceptibility. So for an effective adaptive immune response, we're getting a lot more complexity here, but I just wanna point out that there's two categories of T cells for an effective antiviral response. They're called CD4 positive and CD8 killer T cells. Now killer T cells are exactly what the name says. They're designed to find infected cells within your body and destroy those cells. If a virus has infected your lung cells and has taken over the program of that lung cell to make copies of itself, the body is designed to kill that lung cell. If this is an exaggerated response, if you have too much cell killing, you could damage tissue. If you don't have enough T cell, CD8 T cell activity, you won't clear the virus from your body. So I want to go over this briefly, but when a tissue gets infected with a virus, a specialized cell, innate cell called a macrophage, shown at the top of this slide in pink, will collect that virus and present proteins from that virus to naive T cells and CD8 killer T cells. If you have a younger patient 
there's plenty of naive T cells in the environment to be educated with this new pathogenic protein. If you have a deficiency in CD8 or CD4 naive cells, this may not be as efficient as in younger people. When a CD4 or CD8 cell sees a pathogenic protein from a pathogen like COVID-19, it will leave the lymph node, migrate to that tissue, and either recruit other immune cells or kill that target cell. A CD8 cell, remember, is going to kill any infected cell that it sees. That's the T cell response. The second important response is antibody production. So antibodies can bind to a pathogen and disrupt its function. If you remember, our COVID-19 viral capsid was loaded with spike proteins, ready to engage with those ACE2 receptors on your lung cells. Now imagine a healthy young patient who's mounted an excellent adaptive immune response is producing antibodies to those spike proteins. You would get antibodies coding those spike proteins, preventing engagement with the ACE2 receptor and preventing integration into the cell itself. That's the goal. Helper T cells, CD4 positive helper T cells, can educate B cells on what pathogens are in the environment and help to produce effective and robust antibodies. So remember that this effective immune response on the adaptive side takes many days to develop. And I believe that that's one of the things we see with this disease. We have a progression of disease symptoms in most patients from fever to cough to um, uh, more dangerous symptoms, difficulty breathing, pneumonia, these kinds of things. So I think that we might be dealing with a failure in COVID-19 patients to mount an effective adaptive immune response, mostly in elderly patients or patients with pre-existing conditions. At this point, unfortunately, we don't have any proven treatments available for COVID-19. There is a series of professional uh, resources that are keeping track of all the studies that are being done worldwide. And they try to bring those studies together and get a recommendation for physicians on effective treatments. I know hydroxychloroquine has been touted in the media and some sources. It has not shown any effectivity at this point, and you can follow the link there that will allow you to look at that primary research. Another unfortunate um, trial that did not work out is Tamiflu. Tamiflu is an inhibitor of viral replication. Um, that could have been quite promising, but it just haven't shown, been shown to be effective in stopping the disease. Fortunately, the, an Ebola drug has shown some efficacy and has proven to be safe. One of the most promising therapies at the moment, and there's large clinical trials being started over 1,000 patients, which is really quite large, is to collect the serum, the blood, from people who have recovered. When the serum is collected from the blood, the serum will contain antibodies against COVID-19. These antibodies can then be injected into patients with severe disease. And there's been some evidence that this can help patients recover faster. So we're holding out a lot of hope for this. And it depends on people that have recovered donating their blood. There's a lot of hope too for the future development of a vaccine. Most vaccines work by taking a small piece of the virus, not the functional virus, but a small protein, and injecting it into a patient to elicit an immune response, an adaptive immune response, without the presence of the virus. So I have a lot of hope for this approach, but these approaches do take quite a bit of time, a year or more. Uh, already there are vaccine trials underway, but not efficacy trials. 
The first step in all trials is what's called a safety trial. We cannot be giving compounds to people that are unsafe. We must show that compounds and drugs are safe before we evaluate whether or not they work on COVID-19 patients. There's also uh, active research underway to produce ACE inhibitors. Now remember an ACE receptor is binding to COVID-19 and that's how the, the, the virus is entering into those epithelial cells that line the lung space. If we can block that interaction, the hope is that we can slow that virus down, specifically disrupting that spike protein interaction. This is by far my um, greatest hope for treatments moving forward. And it's a concept called immunomodulation. And it, it requires that we focus on what's happening with each individual patient. And what we wanna do is we wanna treat mortalities and morbidities. Hopefully reduce them to as low as we possibly can. So the aim would be to use our scientific knowledge, the knowledge that I've tried to communicate today in the lecture, to focus the immune response of a patient towards antiviral activities. It looks like a lot of patients, especially in late stages of the disease, have immune systems that are trying to have antibacterial immune responses or antifungal immune responses. And these are not the appropriate responses for a virus. If we can focus the immune system into antiviral responses, we may be able to speed up recovery in a lot of patients. This would be very, very exciting. In the clinic, as we speak, one such approach is showing quite a bit of promise. And it's to block a cytokine, a protein in your body called interleukin-6. And there's a number of drugs that are available that will perform this or similar functions. This is a protein that your immune system secretes when it has encountered a pathogen. It's kind of an alarm bell for the rest of your body. If we can suppress interleukin-6, we can really start to reduce some of those symptoms. And this has shown some benefit. And there's similar approaches, I think, that could be maintained and taken to try to focus the immune response towards an antiviral response. If you're really interested, um, it's, it's a really important to follow up with sites that have the highest quality information that you can get. If you're interested in clinical experience, patient experience, what physicians are trying as we speak, even in small studies, like maybe 10, 10 to 12 patients, there's a journal called The Lancet. And that's where those studies tend to go these days. It's a very high quality journal. And it will really keep you up to date on what clinical studies, clinical experiences are. If you're interested in knowing what the disease, how the disease is gonna play out, when will the pandemic end, how many people in my area will be infected likely, uh, this kind of speculation, uh, the University of Washington has by far the best projection and uh, algorithms to show you how the disease is progressing in your area. There's a link to that you can follow. The Center for Disease Control is the best site to go to for precautions, advice, and recommendations on how to stay safe. If you want to know more internationally how the disease is spreading, Johns Hopkins University has a site that's amalgamating all of the data on that, and you can follow that link. We're still requesting volunteers. If you'd like to be engaged, making masks is a great way to stay engaged in a safe way. Contact Caroline Jones, work within your area, make your own masks, or you can contact me. So at this point, I'd like to kind of open it up to questions. I'm happy to go back and we can review some slides if you have any questions. Um, thank you very much. Hi. Hey, thank you very much for your time and the presentation. I enjoyed it very much. My name's Joe. Um, I have, uh, 
I have a background in psychological research, so I am way out of my depth here. Um, but <clears throat> um, I also have a background in some PPE protective equipment from the tactical training that I had, you know, anti-bio, that kind of stuff. And my understanding is that the, uh, the disease we're dealing with here, the virus we're dealing with here, uh, is too small micron-wise for regular cloth masks to be effective and that it, it can actually permeate those and still, uh, and still be transmitted. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of recommendations, especially from the CDC, to create and wear cloth masks or bandanas. And I'm, I'm just curious as to the effectiveness of those at actually stopping the spread of the virus. I think the best way to think about this is, a, um, uh, is to try to think about it statistically. And I think this will appeal to you, is we're trying to reduce the odds of spread. And if we don't stop all the particles from either leaving an infected patient or being received by a, a healthy individual, then we're gonna reduce transmission by a certain percentage. And that's the argument, as simple as and, that. And good job with the statistical app appealing. I caught yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we can reduce it five, 10%, that this is, this is a lifesaver. It really is a lifesaver, especially at this point in the disease when we're in this exponential growth phase, right? right. Thank you, doctor, I appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, I also have one other question too in regards to like the size of the virus itself. So you did mention how it's going towards more airborne. So does that mean, has it been finalized in airborne precautions? Because wouldn't we need like N95 now instead of like the masks that we are using? Hmm. So yeah, so the question is, um, and we have to, um, you have to bear with me a little bit in that um, as new research comes out, we're, we're trying to stay flexible in our mental idea of how the virus is spreading um, because we just don't understand uh, really at this point. And the argument for airborne transmission is again, a mathematical one uh, based on experiences with patients that were confined on cruise ships and in small quarters. So um, that being said, um, yeah, if you could uh, give everyone an N95 mask, um, you know, that would be uh, the best thing that we could do at this point, but that's not a possibility. There are studies that show the percentage reduction, percent reduction due to just a simple cloth mask, like a two or three ply uh, cotton shirt weave fabric like cloth mask and if both the infected person and the um, the uninfected person are wearing that style mask we can we could anticipate a reduction in transmission so this really I think um, should be seen as hey this could improve the situation it's certainly not anything that solves our problems. And while I'm waiting, uh, I'll just kind of reiterate that our, that our goal is to, with PPE and social distancing, is to suppress rates of transmission below our hospital capacity. Right? So we are working with large numbers of people and just trying to push those levels down People have been saying flatten the curve, trying to suppress transmission levels below the number of beds we would need to uh, treat sick people. I have a question about, uh, you mentioned the uh, <clears throat> effectiveness of UV light in uh, right. destroying the virus. Do we, do we have any actual uh, knowledge or numbers on this, like how effective sunlight is in destroying it and, and uh, that sort of stuff? Yeah, so I think um, some of that depends on research with um, other coronaviruses. And like, I, like I've been reiterating, we're dealing with an unknown and often um, dealing with non-ideal data. Most of the studies on transmission are not going to be looking at competency of the virus after a specific amount of time. 
What I mean by competency is the ability of that virus to then go out and infect a person. So most of the studies you're gonna see on, let's say, airborne transmission or surface transmission will likely overestimate the infectivity of that virus. If high energy particles or uh, let's say a dehydrating or chemically active substance like peroxide, bleach, alcohol gets on the virus, it's gonna cause chemical damage that chemically damaged virus will still be detectable by the PCR-based tests that are used to analyze the effectiveness of those treatments most of the time. But a damaged virus is gonna be poor at replicating itself. So I think that there's a lot of hope that our understanding of physics and chemistry uh, is gonna be appropriate or um, serve us well in designing ways to uh, sterilize masks, for example, for reuse. And it's certainly better than just keeping uh, those, those PPE materials circulating in the medical community. So Chris, Sabrina sent a couple questions over chat that I'll read for, for you. Um, there's three different questions and there's one more below from someone else. But the first one is with us not knowing much, how are they projecting end times? Oh yeah, I think we should, um, we should, really, we should really take those projections with a, a grain of salt. So um, there's a lot of variability in all the models uh, because we just, we just don't know enough. Um, and we, just, we do not have enough data points to, I think, accurately predict the tail ends of those curves, how the virus will dissipate in the populations, um, we're, we're, gonna have to, we're gonna have to see. We have an N of one, uh, the experience of Wuhan and Hubei province. Um, it's not a whole lot of data to go on. Uh, so I, I think we, um, we have to watch out if it, it, until we start getting more data about how the disease is gonna play out over the next a month or so. Yep. Okay. Then she also asked, what's stopping a second pandemic once they end quarantine? And are they only going to end once a virus is, once a vaccine is found? Uh, yeah, I can't answer either of those. Um, I would anticipate a, another round. Um, I don't know when that would occur. I, I think it depends on when states start relaxing their social distancing restrictions and start to get the economies going again and travel going again. Um, the hope is that we're gonna buy time. We're gonna buy time for treatments to come online and for the infrastructure we need, the testing infrastructure, the monitoring infrastructure to come online. Once those occur, um, I think we can much more safely handle the virus, but I can't anticipate when that would be. And I'm skeptical of, of anybody um, making that prediction as well. Uh, then Victoria asked, are clients given ACE inhibitors to reduce the chances of the spike protein attaching itself to the ACE2 receptor? Can, can I uh, just pause for one second and reiterate my disclaimer? So I'm... Um, you know, doing my best to interpret the data as I see it and with my ex personal experiences. And all of you as professionals know that when you really dig deep into your profession, um, you, you have a tool to understand the world and that's your hammer, right? And so hammers, they're good at banging down nails. So problems start looking like nails. So my personal and professional experiences are all that I have to depend on when I, um, start talking about maybe epidemiological data, not an epidemiologist or a virologist. Um, I do have a background in pharmacology or how drugs are being used. Uh, I don't think ACE inhibitors are going to be uh, used in, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the status is on ACE inhibitors, um, but I do know that agents, similar agents with similar goals, like Tamiflu, are used as prophylactics. Uh, once you're infected, their uh, efficacy is, is, I'm not sure how efficacious they would be, 
but they may have some benefit as prophylactics for people in healthcare settings. That's as good as I can do at the moment. Um, but I guess I hope you guys appreciate that in a lot of these questions, I'm kind of going out on a limb and uh, well outside my professional expertise and more on the side of, a, of um, you know, educated opinion or educated guess. So I hope you appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Then Scott said, I read a paper yesterday that discussed if non-human animals are able to be infected. Uh, the paper provided evidence that cats and ferrets both are able to be infected by humans, but they didn't see it going the other way. No cats, ferrets were able to infect humans, but it was a small and very short study. How likely do you think it is that the virus be, will be able to be transmitted from infected animals back to humans? That, that is the theory on how the disease started. Um, there was a debate for a while on whether or not it was bats or pangolins that originally transmitted the disease uh, from, from animals to humans. Uh, I think bats is, is now the consensus that it was, it was first in bats. I can't really speculate uh, at this point on, on transmission with household pets. Uh, but I have read those studies as well, yeah. So when I go shopping, come home, and what's the best thing I can do to, uh, um, to make sure that uh, all the groceries is not contaminated? <laughs> wash, wash your vegetables. Um, you were probably doing that already, right? Yeah, um, I do, but like coming uh, into the house, and should I like hose it down before all the bags and everything before I bring it into the house? So, you know, when, when we work in the lab with hazardous material, we always okay. assume that it's our hands uh, that are contaminated. Okay. So um, what, I, what I do is I have a box of Clorox wipes or a spray bottle with ethanol, and I will spray down... Um, some materials with ethanol for three to five minutes. The research shows that within three to five minutes with ethanol or rubbing alcohol, that the virus capsid will break apart and, and the virus won't be effective. Um, the other thing, you could take a Clorox wipe and wipe things down and then uh, wash your vegetables with uh, soap and water. So, and then wash your hands and then you're, you're in good shape. With soap and water, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Chris, I have a question. Um, this is Carrie, um, Dr. Hi, Carrie. Jones. Um, I'm curious if we know anything about um, different strains and mutations. And let me ask it or phrase it this way. Um, it seems like, given a population of, I don't know, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, it doesn't matter. It seems like the symptoms range hugely between someone who's got it and got it really, really bad and ends up in the hospital and someone who's got it and they don't even know they have it and they're over it in a week or two weeks. So how do we think that this is actually different strains? We, I know, of course, overlaid on top of that is different people have different responses to things and their immune system is healthy or not and stress and all that kind of stuff in there. But it does seem to be that there's a really huge response rate to this, a vari variety of the responses to this, and I'm curious how much of that has to do with the virus already mutating, because it's going to mutate and it's going to mutate really fast, or how much of it just has to do with the fact that we're all really different? <laughs> yeah, this is a really good question. And uh, my understanding is that this is due to each individual's response. So they can track mutations that have occurred in this virus already and there's a certain number that have occurred. And they've been using that to, those mutations, to track the spread. So it looks like the outbreaks in New York and on the East Coast were transmitted from Europe. And that was done through a mutational analysis. While the West Coast outbreaks were from um, the East. Now, the demographics and epidemiology seem to be similar within both populations as far as the degree of symptoms. And we're talking about a huge gap here between lethal disease and mm -hmm. no symptoms whatsoever. It mm -hmm. seems to match with age, not with where you got infected or by whom. 
Okay, thank you. I also have another question if, if I can go next in line. Is it is it true that, and I, I don't know this, and, and maybe you don't either, and that's fine, but is it true that pneumonia is usually not bilaterally symmetrical, but that's in fact what we are seeing for every COVID patient? You know, I haven't dug into that. Hmm, I okay. really haven't. So yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, can't, can't meet you there. But there, there are some, um, some clinical pa pa papers on um, how the infection spreads within, within the lung. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Oh, and thanks for doing this, by the way. This is really fantastic. So John just wrote, hey, Professor, my household is one that we take extra big care to clean anything that goes into the house. And I was just wondering how long the virus can live outside of a host, specifically with a coronavirus. Yeah, so um, up, to, up to and a little bit exceeding two weeks um, on specific types of materials, cardboard seem to be a little bit longer lasting. So all these studies, of course, you need to take with a grain of salt and, and understand that these studies would err on the more cautious side. Okay, so um, wipe things down that you want to bring into the house. That's a precaution that I take. Um, and I think that two week period is, is what people are settling in on. How long the virus can live on things too. So I'm living in Arizona where we still have plastic trash bags and they're actually not letting us use our recyclable or reusable bags anymore. So we've been taking our groceries and wiping them down and spraying them with bleach water and leaving them outside before we bring them inside and wash them and wash all the fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. But for the plastic trash bags, like the Safeway bags and stuff like that, we like to reuse them as trash bags. So we left them mm. outside in the sun for like 15 minutes. Do you think that's long enough to for it to be safe to bring them inside the house? Well, I don't know if any. I don't think anybody's done that. Um, I will. I will state. You know, precautions are are great. Um, have you considered maybe putting them in the washing machine? I mean, would that that's gum up the works? I, mean, we could I don't do know. That, or we could just throw um, them away and not try to reuse them. Yeah, I mean, we just, there's so much about this disease we don't know, but based on our experience with transmission so far, it looks to be mostly uh, airborne related and not, not this perfect contact related. So maybe that would give you some pause about how much care you're taking. And, and my gut tells me we should, I should always be advising you to err on the side of caution. Um, okay. When, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I can't quite hear that question, so. So if, um, if you're asking a question and you're not getting a response, you may, you may be better served typing it into the comments line, in the chat line. So I'm I um I'm kind of waiting. I think there's some questions, but uh, they're not quite coming through. So type them in if you got them. Uh, I'd just like to end on a happy note that you know there's a lot going on for clinical. Uh, trials. There's a lot going on that's happening in the healthcare setting where doctors are struggling to find treatments that work. And I do think we're narrowing down some good treatments for immunomodulation that show some short-term promise. Um, a lot of the other vaccines and drugs, they're going to take a while to get into the clinics to, to be shown to be safe, but I think there are, are some treatment options that are really going to help. Hey, Chris, uh, you mentioned earlier that you shouldn't really go out for a jog. Is, is that because of, you know, picking up like a random particle or is there some other reason? I would think you'd be sort of social distance with that activity and it's 
that it's good to get out as we're all confined. I was just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, I think I, I think that yeah, we, we all love to, to get out, but if if we're gonna um, practice social distancing, this is really the time period to do that. If you were to wait a couple of weeks, you know, we're hoping the peak of the crisis and the peak for the rate, the highest possibility that you're going to get infected will have already passed because, you know, most people that contracted the disease are, are sick and at home. So the next week and then the week following, those are going to be your highest risk weeks mm -hmm. for going out and interacting with, with people. Um, and it is airborne. So I would, uh, my suggestion is that we just try to maximize our social distancing over the, over the next week. If you can jog uh, when there's no one around, of course, that's social distancing too. So. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Yeah. If you're alone, it shouldn't be a high risk. Uh, right. Thanks. Activity. Bill. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Thank Bill. you. Yeah. So Sabrina just asked, I deliver for Uber Eats. Is that a bad idea? What, or what precautions should I be taking? Thank you so much um, for doing that. Um, you guys should be ranked right up there with doctors and nurses for uh, the service that you're doing. Um, I just can't tell you how much you're helping people maintain social distancing, but do, do stay safe. Um, Sabrina, if you, if you have a mask, wear it. If you don't have a mask, um, maybe a, like a bandana or something that you can wear around your nose uh, and face um, would be good. Um, I'm not quite sure how Uber Eats works. I haven't, I haven't used it. So I, I don't know if you have interaction with customers or not, or if it's just a drop-off system. Um, encourage your, you know, your employer to help you maximize social distancing over the next couple of weeks. Um, but thank, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, food insecurity is, is, is a real and growing issue over the next couple of weeks as well. And, and you're really helping with that. Yeah. So if, if, if you are to leave it at the door and walk away, that's, you're, you're, you're all right, you're doing, you're doing well, and you are a vital service, so thank you. Uh, John is asking about people that are still out. Yeah, my, new, my neighborhood's terrible. They're just, not, they're just not really staying inside like they need to. You guys, I, I'd, I, would, I could spend probably a whole lecture just on that modeling image that we showed um, where we looked at rates of transmission over time. I'd love to get somebody from computer science or mathematics to help out with that because this, this is so fascinating to me. This is based on assumptions, right? All of these models are based on the idea that people are doing what they're asked to do. So, if they're asking you to cut down your social contacts by 75%, that means, you know, three out of the four people you interact with in the day, you should try not to interact with those people. Um, and you, you don't do that, but the model is based on you having done that. There's going to be a lot of uh, error and we're in for a bad time. So, yeah, I think that um, still seeing people out, in, in food places is a little bit disturbing. I, I wish that we wouldn't, especially right now in, in the stage that we're at in the epidemic. And you know, in a couple of weeks, I think we're gonna see some clearer skies. I hope we see some clearer skies. And that depends on people's social distancing today, right? Another question from Brandon. Um, he's thinking a glass half full here. Um, oh, <laughs> what are the benefits of all of this great a reduction in travel and um, are there benefits to the environment? I hope there is some silver lining here that we can all uh, hope that the environment is getting uh, a breath of fresh air here so we're all staying inside. So yeah, I hope that's the case, Brandon.
Uh, Tracy, Tracy's asking about recurrence. Yeah, so the cycle will unfortunately begin again. Um, if we don't have effective control measures in place, but there's no precedent for this, right? So we don't have any real data to go on. And that means we can only speculate. We can use mathematics to try to refine our speculations, like the graph that I have on the screen right now. Look for news out of China. China has um, no community spread at this point, and they only have occurrences based on travelers coming from outside the country into the country. How effective are they gonna be at stopping community spread? How effective are they gonna be at um, tracking people with the disease? Um, that's where we're gonna learn about those cycles beginning again. Um, hopefully we can learn from their example and start implementing our own controls and testing measures. Um, So, yeah, so I, um, I, I'm looking, so Brandon also had a question about these metropolitan areas and how they're suffering in these uh, circumstances. So when I think about the situation in Hawaii, um, I think we need to be planning for worst case scenarios. That doesn't mean worst case scenarios will occur, but if we plan for the worst, we're much better positioned than if we just hope for the best. New York, uh, if we look at those news stories, if we anticipate their challenges, they're having locally produced personal protective equipment, uh, 3D printers trying to print ventilator parts, uh, producing um, mobile hospitals, um, these are the kinds of experiences uh, that I think we need to be learning from. I, I think Hawaii has had exceptional state and local leadership on this. Uh, Josh Green in particular, our Lieutenant Governor, and our uh, Mayor Caldwell from Honolulu deserve a, really a lot of credit for taking action early and, and really keeping Hawaii safe at this point. Um, this is, this, these are the sorts of things that are in their minds, uh, I hope, and that they're going to be taking kind of a proactive approach. Sabrina also is asking, how can you believe what you see in media reports? Um, this is a tough one. Uh, it's something we've been struggling with for um, a very long time. Um, and this is, this is my personal opinion. I, I feel very, very strongly about these issues. The degree to which you believe what you read from a media account, so do you have a high degree of confidence in what you read or a low degree in confidence? How do you, how do you put that bar? Right? You need to think about the repercussions for the individual that is relaying the information to you. If that input individual has no repercussions for misleading you, your trust should be very low. Is that clear, Sabrina? If that individual will face some repercussion professionally for the information that they give you, you can raise that bar to a higher level. Personally, my personal professional integrity um, is linked to the information that I'm providing. I won't face any reprimand, I don't think, if I do mislead you. But I have tried to link you to the sources that I'm using to guide my own judgment. Almost everything, I, I was a little pressed for time here, but almost everything in this report has been linked to a source that you yourself can go read and evaluate. Secondly, I have only used sources where if that individual misleads you, they face pro professional repercussions. 
if someone from the CDC misleads you, they can and will be terminated. We know who those individuals are. Their behavior will be recorded and tracked. One of the benefits of professional science is that the behavior and conduct of all individuals engaging in professional academic science are recorded. We can look at their papers. We can see what they did. We know who those individuals are. And most of the time, those individuals rely on funds from the government or some other source to continue their research. Individuals that violate professional standards, individuals that mislead you, maybe give you false hope, that maybe hydrochloroquine is going to cure your disease. If a professional academic scientist makes that claim and benefits from that claim, they can have their funding withdrawn, right? So they have an incentive not to mislead you. That's a very, very long answer. But in the scientific and public health and medical professional communities, there's a lot of safeguards undergirding their behavior, okay? So those are institutions that have institutional safeguards within them. And so when I look for something that I can depend on, I really do go to the Centers for Disease Control. And I do go to publications like The Lancet because I understand their professional safeguards and how they work, right? And so individuals that communicate through those resources they have to go through many, many rounds of verification before that information gets disseminated to the public. This might seem a little bit frustrating because they're gonna be slow. We're not gonna know how effective this vaccine is that they're producing, probably for another year, because all of those safeguards, those professional safeguards are gonna have to be checked and there's no ethical way to get around them. We cannot be giving vaccines that are proven to be unsafe to people. We can't be selling vaccines to people before we know they're effective. It's unethical to do so, right? So I, I could spend another lecture just going over that material, but just you can go, there's a, a few high quality resources you can go to. The Center for Disease Control is one of them. They have, a lot of material that you can um, really put your faith in because it's been really vetted. And they're really on the overly cautious side of things. In professional science, so Science Magazine or Nature Magazine, those are the top tier scientific journals. They're gonna cover a lot, anything you wanna know about experimental drugs, the state of drug trials, timelines on drug deliveries, I would go to those sources. If you wanna know about how patients are feeling and experiencing and how doctors are trying to fight this disease on a daily basis with small groups of patients, go to a site like The Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine. Those sites are covering those clinical experiences, but they're not gonna give you the broad overview of how the healthcare system is adapting. All right, so thank you, thank you, Sabrina. And then, um, no, th this, this has been recorded, I think, Kayla, is that correct? Yep, so this has all been recorded and I've missed a question on the chat line um, that was previously, if you could type that in again. If I missed, missed your question, go ahead, and, go ahead and type it in again there. So I can only see one or two here. Also, if anybody is wanting copies of the slideshow or the link to the video when we post it, you can either put your email, your email in here and we'll get it sent out or there's a form link higher up in the chat, but I'm keeping track of all the emails being entered here so we can send the info out. Yeah, yeah thank you. Chris, um, one, just one question regarding the uh, slide you have up here. Um, you know, we've seen from New York that a lot of people are on the, uh, you know, ventilators for um, two or three weeks or more. Yeah. And, and they're wondering if it's really going to see this drop down in that curve or if it's going to continue out, you know, in which case, you know, that obviously it's a, it could be, you know, higher mortality. 
concern that um, you know to be conservative. Um, yeah, you should look at that and look at the number of ventilators that uh, are available too. Yeah, it's really it is really heartbreaking, and we're really just in uncharted territory. I'm sorry that we can't tell you how that back end is going to play out. These are mathematical models. And yeah. so the assumptions are built in. And if we can go back just for a second into research integrity, you can go to this website and you can figure out, they'll tell you what variables they use and what they're accounting for. And that will tell you what they're thinking about for that back end. How quickly will that drop happen? People in intensive care units, they're not spreading the disease. Hopefully medical staff are safe, right? So that's taking an infected person out of the population if they're in the hospital. Yeah. That's in that model, right? In my classes, I've been challenging my students to come up with variables that are specific to Hawaii that are not in this model. In other words, all models like this are wrong in some way. Is it a small way or is it a big way? This model does not account for things that are specific to the Hawaiian population. So we expect this model to be wrong in very particular ways. And it's a good educational tool for them to think about why that is the case. So many Hawaiians live in multi-generational homes. This is gonna be a big issue for transmission. Yeah. Second, the Hawaiian Islands are all broken up. So we're not gonna have the mobility that Massachusetts has, right? Where people aren't, can't get in a car and drive a thousand miles away. So Hawaii has specific threats. Hawaii has specific benefits. So <laughs> we're just gonna have to see how the data plays out. Uh -huh. So um, thank you. If you're wearing cloth, ma cloth masks, I am. Uh, I tried to make my own and I didn't invent new curse words, but it was not, <laughs> wasn't pretty, <laughs> it's not easy for me. And, and you know, we're, we're, I'm work, trying to work my way through it. And my, my kid and my wife are engaged with it. Thank you for wearing masks. I do when I go outside the house, if I have to, I just wear a bandana because I can manage that personally. Yeah. And I expect in a, in a month, a couple weeks maybe, uh, that things will, we'll see some, some light through the clouds here. Yeah, let's hope so. I think, yeah, it's good. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for the information. Yeah. Okay. So last uh, last chance to get in questions. I think I'm I'm kind of wearing out. Yep. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah, share it. Go ahead and share it. Yep, share share the, the material and information. I'd love it if any if anybody from my uh, fall immunology class is is online. Um, you guys, if if you're there and you and you're feeling brave, if you want to speculate on therapies, you would be interested in trying. Remember that all biologics would be on the table. Um, I know I have my, if I was in a clinic, I, I would have my um, ideas that, uh, that may help. Um, if you'd like to, to voice that, um, maybe that would be, uh, it would all be speculative, of course, but I'd love to hear if you have any ideas on um, a therapy that you think might, might help these people. Okay, I, I guess everybody's feeling shy or they've already um, uh, started their weekend maybe. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really hopeful about immunomodulation. So any factor that you've read about for immunomodulation, um, uh, be looking forward to any data that comes out about, about those uh, biologics. Okay. <clears throat>